Okay, welcome to our review of ancient and classical Chinese history, and we're going to do that using their art. So remember you have your handy note sheet hopefully nearby, and um, be prepared on the test to recognize, um, be able to identify some of these pieces of art. So let's begin uh, with some of the earliest um, pieces from even Neolithic times, uh, the B or the Bai, I'm not sure. Um, but they're these jade discs. And even as early as um, the Neolithic times before civilization began, um, archaeologists found these discs um, on bodies in the graves. You can see this practice would carry on even through the Han Dynasty as they become more intricate. Um, and we'll start to see jade become a symbol of the elite um, in Trady society. So another important um, symbol in art is the dragon. And the dragon was a symbol of a cosmic energy and also good fortune. And it started to become associated even as early as the Zhou dynasty with the emperor. And often his wife was then portrayed as a phoenix, right? A mystical bird that uh, rose from the ashes. And so think about what we've been talking about in terms of Chinese society and what do we think the dragon might represent? Um, or what does that tell us about Chinese society? And can we make any Confucian connections? Okay. So with our earliest dynasties, right, the Shang and the Zhou, we started to see their use of bronze vessels. Um, and these vessels would have been used in uh, ritualistic um, ceremonies. Remember, the earliest religion would have been sort of um, uh, animistic, you know, seeing the spirits in nature, and these were then used in rituals to maybe placate nature or, as we talked about, communicate with the ancestors so the ancestors could um, intervene on their behalf or speak to the gods, if you will, uh, for help. And so um, from the earliest forms of the Shang um, bronze vessels, we see the Tao Dai, which we talked about in class. Um, and so even with the Zhou dynasty, the, we see the symbols carry on. Um, and so what do we think the purpose might be? It's still sort of mysterious, but perhaps uh, symbolizing nature or the spirits in nature could be an idea. Um, and also then the use of oracle bones. And we also spoke of this in class, um, where things were written, questions were written on these bones. I think this is a tortoise shell. And then you can see the cracks, right? So they might place it in fire or other means of cracking it. And depending on how it cracked, right, would give them indication of the answers of what the ancestors might be revealing to them. So what do you think these oracle bones play? What role do they play in development of writing? So if they're trying to communicate with their ancestors as from the beginning, um, the Chinese have one of the earliest forms of writing. So um, as we move through, remember after the Zhou dynasty, there were there was a 200 year period of um, civil war until Qin Shi Huangdi then um, brought China under his control, uh, or a large part of China, under the Qin dynasty. And one of his great accomplishments is the his tomb, right? We saw pictures of that, and then the terracotta army that surrounds or guards his tomb. And... Um, Thinking of this, right, one of us, the sunny examples of um, classical Chinese dynasties, along with the terracotta army and the Great Wall, 
Um, and so how does the Great Wall, this fortification, and his tomb um, showing military strength reflect legalism? So I'm going to let you ponder that, and uh, I'll ask you next time I see you. Um, so we start to see also a continuing influence of jade, right? And this is um, a burial suit found in the Han Dynasty. So who do you think would have been buried in something like this? What role in society or what rank would they have? And how do you think Confucianism would uh, reflect this? Um, somebody being buried in the jade suit, and you can see the buys over here, the discs of jade that would have been placed in important parts on the body. Okay, so now we're going to look at some other forms of art, and you'll notice some of these dates are from almost pre-modern times, so um, I tried to go as old as I could. So one of the most um, famous pieces of Chinese art is uh, calligraphy, and so you can see this is not what people, this is, has, this calligraphy is more of an artistic form of writing, not um, for academic purposes, if you will, but more as a way to express themselves. And so how do you think this reflects uh, Confucian values? So we've discussed by the time of the Han, Confucianism then will remain one of the dominating, if not the most dominating, um, philosophy of Chinese civilization, how would calligraphy represent that? Um, remember um, the role of education and uh, with the civil service exams, but I don't know, I'll let you think about it, but I think it's interesting to see that their writing becomes also artistic. So another um, form of art that we'll see throughout Chinese history, as far as this is from oops, the Song Dynasty, um, which we will discuss later in the year. Um, but think of then maybe more Taoist influences as we see the purpose of um, the Chinese landscape paintings. But this is something, notice the underlying thing that we should be aware for the test. Um, something, a theme then in Chinese art are the three perfections. So we have painting, and we'll talk more about poetry throughout what we see, maybe poetry in Taoist literature, and then of course calligraphy. So these are known as the three perfections. Um, so something that's kind of interesting in the landscape painting is kind of the role of the blank space. Um, that it doesn't trail off into a horizon or something that we might see in Western European paintings. And so this becomes negative space. And so, you know, what is that trying to symbolize here? What role does nature have in Chinese society? And notice um, animals here, or in the other paintings, we'll look at some man-made objects and how do they compare to um, the, the nature around them. I think I already gave you this answer, right? Taoist? Okay, so here's some other paintings a little bit closer to the Han period. Um, and so you can see um, the importance of nature here. And you can see, though, in this painting, we can see the human figures um, a little bit more, uh, I don't know, equal into nature. And then here's one of my favorites. Um, and so again, nature becomes kind of this mystical place. Um, and then they often have one mountain taller than the others, which can sometimes symbolize um, the emperor. Well, I think these are quite beautiful, right? Okay, and so look at this one um, here, the ships, right? And so we see a taller mountain and the negative space here, right? And so what's the relationship between human beings and nature? And what do you think these landscape paintings are trying to um, tell, tell us? Okay, so with the Han Dynasty, we talked about the Silk Road um, starts to connect 
uh, the Chinese civilizations with the outside. And through the Silk Road came Buddhism. And with that, then a new form of art. And so we've seen these statues before when we talked about um, Buddhism in India. And so these Buddhist monks from India would come into China. So we start to see temples being built. Um, some of them were then built in caves, like this one. And we see then, regardless of what country Buddhism spreads, the art and the sculptures look similar, right? Because as we spoke, similar to Hinduism, um, the statues become symbolic, right? So we see um, the elongated earlobes to show that Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, came from wealth, right? That jewels um, were so heavy in his ears, right, that they dragged his earlobes down, but now that they're empty, um, we often see kind of dots, either a divot or kind of a bump in the middle of the forehead, um, like a cranial protuberance. Um, talking about kind of the third eye that we can focus um, through meditation and to kind of gain greater insight or enlightenment, um, that, but that helps us focus. And we see the similar hairstyle of one who had left wealth and luxury behind. And so paintings also emerge of the Buddha, so you can see the similar characteristics. Often you need to pay attention to the hands, where the hands are placed. They might, um, they indicate at different stages of the Buddha's life. This one is um, of his enlightenment. When he uh, becomes the Buddha, he touches the earth, saying that the earth is the witness to his enlightenment. Uh, if we look at this one, sometimes his hands up, um, could be when he's talking to people or a, a gesture of peace. Um, and then here we see then the bodhisattvas surrounding the Buddha. Remember, bodhisattvas were people who had achieved, um, they could have reached nirvana or enlightenment, but chose to stay behind and help other people attain, uh, excuse me, attain nirvana and uh, enlightenment. Okay, and so the last um, piece of architecture that we'll look at here are pagodas. So these will become religious structures, both Taoist and Buddhist. Um, and you can see oftentimes they have a little curve here, uh, represent the climb towards nirvana. Um, this is a little bit past the Han Dynasty, but here's the uh, one of the oldest examples of uh, pagodas in China the giant wild goose pagoda. Um, and a lot of these things are gone, right? China, as you will learn next year in 10th grade history, had a rough beginning to the 20th century. Um, and so I think this is one of the oldest pagodas in China. Okay, so hopefully you have enjoyed this review of Chinese history, looking through the art, and your note sheet will help guide you to the things that um, you should be able to identify on the test.